Okay, so this is where we'll cover part two of the urinary system where we talk about the different pathologic conditions as well as some of the diagnostic uh, testing and procedures that go along with this body system. Okay, so the first disease process that we have is cystitis. Um, and this isn't, basically it means inflammation of the urinary bladder. It could, there's a couple of different kinds of cystitises, but oftentimes you'll hear this referred to as a UTI or a bladder infection. Um, generally the symptoms that will be characterized with that will be dysuria, which is painful urination, urgency, which is the urgent feeling to go to the bathroom, as well as frequency where you're going more often or more frequent intervals, but not necessarily producing any more urine. Um, that inflammation can sometimes be accompanied by hematuria, where we actually have visible or gross blood in the urine. Okay, other things that can accompany that are generally pyuria, which is pus or bacteria. Um, uh, leukocytes can oftentimes be associated with that, which is, goes along with the pus and the bacteria. Um, and sometimes you can even get a little bit of protein that comes from that, but that doesn't happen all the time. Okay. Generally, this condition, if it is a bacteria causing the infection or the inflammation, then you need to treat it. Um, there is something called interstitial cystitis, which is often confused with um, a bladder infection. They have similar symptoms, but usually no dysuria or hematuria, um, and that usually needs to be followed up with a urologist. Then we have something called glomerulonephritis, and this is... Um, this is an infection that actually occurs more commonly in your childhood, adolescent, and early teenhood, usually five to 15. And when you look at that word, there's a couple things you can pull out of it. Number one, we see the word itis, so we know it's an inflammation of some sort. And then we have two parts of the kidney here. We have glomerulo and then nephro. And so glomerulo refers to the glomerulus, and nef nephro is one of the combining forms for kidney. So this is an inflammation primarily of the glomeruli, which then causes an inflammation of the entire kidney. Um, what happens in this case is it usually occurs um, from an untreated um, streptococcal infection. Someone gets a strep throat, doesn't treat it, and then that untreated strep bacteria in the system can actually cause a toxin that um, creates um, inflammation within the glomerulus of the kidney. There's two other potential complications from untreated streptococcal infection, scarlet fever, as well as rheumatic fever. So both of those are similar situations. In this case, that toxin actually affects the glomerulus and that person starts having swelling, hypertension. Um, the urine starts to show proteinuria, which means there's protein, um, gross excessive hematuria, and we actually notice a decrease in urine production, oligouria. And so, there's a characteristic um, kind of a smoky dark appearance that uh, patients get when they have glomerulonephritis that almost looks like cola or Coca-Cola. Um, and that's kind of pathognomonic of what happens with this particular disease process. And so these people that get this infection, it's important to make sure they have to take a, a prolongated um, round of antibiotics. Um, they have to restrict their sodium and their water consumption in order to deal with the hypertension. Most people recover from this, but there are a small amount of people that actually will get glomerulosclerosis or a hardening or a scarring from this infection. Other times it can actually lead to something called uh, nephrosis or nephrotic syndrome, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Then we have hydronephrosis. So if you break this word apart, osis means a condition of. Sometimes it usually refers to something abnormal. Hydro refers to water. Nephro is our, one of our combining forms for kidney. And so this is a case scenario where you have a distension um, of the renal pelvis in the kidney and the calyces. And it's usually caused by um, excessive amounts of urine that have built up because it can't flow normally through the ureter. And so generally this is going to happen from either um, some form of obstruction in the ureter so that it backs up the urine um, behind it into the kidney. And so this could be a uh, kidney stone, also called a renal calculus, um, can cause this, as can strictures or narrowing of the ureter. And so this can be a very significant condition because as the kidney swells, it can then lead to decreased function of the kidney. So prolonged hydronephrosis can actually alter kidney function and cause kidney failure on one side. And so it is a significant issue. 
And so that's why treating the according issue is important to prevent prolonged or chronic uh, kidney, kidney damage from that point. Then we have something called nephrotic syndrome. Now, sometimes, rarely, there are possibilities that a person that gets this syndrome can be from a glomerulus, a glomerulonephritis. Other times it can actually happen kind of spontaneously. There is a little higher risk with um, patients that have diabetes. But what happens in this condition is a lot of people will present with um, excessive amounts of generalized swelling throughout the body. And so what happens is the kidneys start excreting abnormally large amounts of protein for one reason or another. There's some sort of inflammation within the kidney and it starts secreting severe amounts of it. And so what happens is our protein water balance get off in our bloodstream and it starts causing excessive amounts of swelling. So these patients will report intermittent localized and or generalized swelling. Then when you do a workup and do urine, you'll see that they're losing a ton of, um, of protein in the urine. And so once again, this is another condition. They call it nephrotic syndrome. It's also called nephrosis. A couple of different reasons why it can happen. Chronic UTIs can sometimes cause it, um, but you have to kind of battle um, protein intake and water intake in order to deal with this long term. Okay. Then we have a condition called polycystic kidney disease. Sometimes you'll see it acronymed PKD. Um, what happens here is we have a hereditary disorder of the kidney, and it's usually bilateral on both sides, where the normal area where you have the nephrons in the renal tubular system, that area starts becoming, um, starts becoming replaced by large grape-like fluid-filled sacs or cysts um, of fluid. And so it takes over the normal nephron tubular system, and then that area can no longer... Um, you be processed or do the normal filtration that it does. So you can see here um, what they can start to look like. They become extremely large, filled with cysts. And once again, that decreases the area of the nephron so the kidneys can no, can no longer filter adequately. So people that have this, this is a, it's rare, but it is, it is a hereditary condition. There are a couple of different types. There's one that's actually very severe that can hit um, in adolescence and that, that can it can lead to fatality in adolescence. Um, there are there is a, a a version in adults it's a little longer it takes a little longer it's a little more insidious but eventually these patients either need a kidney transplant or they are on lifelong um, dialysis in order to combat this problem. Okay so question on what we covered so far Distension, which means enlargement of the kidney and ureter due to an obstruction is called, so the answer here would be B, it would be hydronephrosis because that's an enlargement, would be an enlargement, so the answer is B. However, um, a renal calculus or a kidney stone, that's another word for a kidney stone, is oftentimes the primary cause of this, okay? Um, a stricture or narrowing of the ureter can cause it as well. Um, but that is hydronephrosis. So cystitis, remember, is inflammation of the bladder, usually from some form of bacteria or infection. The renal calculi is not the distension of the kidney, but it is the primary cause. Polycystic kidney disease is the autoimmune process where we have um, fluid-filled sacs that take over the nephrons. Okay. All right, and another um, type of infection that occurs is called pyelonephritis. Um, if we, they use the word acute because it's usually a, a situation where we have an acute sudden onset of inflammation, usually due to an infection um, that affects both the um, renal pelvis as well as the kidney itself, but it usually starts in the renal pelvis. So if we split this word apart, we see pylo and we see nephro. So the pylo is referring to the renal pelvis, which is the inner portion where the calyces come together. It's the upper part of the ureter. Nef nephro is that combining form that means kidney, okay? This is the prototypical term. This is actually a diagnostic term that's used for someone that has a kidney infection, okay? This is the diagnostic term that you write um, for that infection. If something starts in the bladder, like a UTI or a cystitis, if that's not treated, then the bacteria can ascend through the ureter and actually creep into the kidney via the, um, the renal pelvis. And so that can then lead to a generalized infection in the kidney. 
those people might have started with a couple of days of um, maybe burning with urination, some frequency, but maybe it came and went and they drank a little bit of extra fluids. All of a sudden they wake up the next day and they're running fever and they've got upper um, unilateral or even bilateral um, pain underneath the back part of the rib cage. Sometimes there'll be excessive fatigue, body aches, nausea and vomiting. Um, and so that is indicative of the fact that we've got a kidney infection. Okay, so this is our prototypical um, diagnosis for that. And they use the word acute because it is something that is not a chronic condition. It is something that happens abruptly and suddenly. These people generally need antibiotics. Um, you can usually handle them um, on an outpatient basis, giving them a shot of rocephin or a shot of antibiotics and then following up with 10 days. We usually like to follow these patients up in a day or two if we send them home to make sure um, that we get um, a culture of the urine because usually their urine will show that they've got an infection as well. There can be blood and protein and sometimes there can still be white blood cells and bacteria as well. So we always want to get a culture on these patients and follow them up in one to two days to make sure um, that we're treating them with the adequate uh, back antibiotic and that they're actually improving. So then we, right here they insert the word renal calculus. So it's important to realize that calculus is indicating a stone. Another word for stone would be lithiasis or an abnormal condition of stones. And so you could say renal lithiasis, renal calculi, renal stone, kidney stone. They all kind of mean the same thing. Um, and so the reason why stones form vary from person to person. Some people are more prone to it. There can be a genetic component. Um, sometimes people's um, internal metabolism just crystallizes things like calcium a little bit more often. Um, water consumption is important. Important. Sometimes they'll find that people that um, seem to be more subject to these infections will not report drinking a lot of water. So that can play a little bit of a part of it but it's not the only cause. There's some other internal um, factors that are involved as well. So those are all the words basically that mean kidney stone. And once again, those stones can potentially get caught anywhere from the kidney all the way down the ureter into the bladder. And so those can be sources of hydronephrosis if they obstruct the ureter completely. Um, then we'll talk about, here they talk about renal cell carcinoma. And there's two specific cancers that we refer to um, in this particular body system. There are others, but the two primary ones are listed here. This is one of them. Um, sometimes you'll see it acronymed RCC, renal cell carcinoma. It is a malignant tumor of the kidney, but it is primarily in adulthood. And the reason why it's a little tough um, is that you don't generally get symptoms or become symptomatic until in the later stages. It's kind of like ovarian cancer, where a lot of times once you start becoming symptomatic of it, you're already in stage four and sometimes it's already too late. So that is the unfortunate thing about renal cell carcinoma. Um, that's why getting physical exams, making sure that you have regular, you know, your analysis done once a year. A lot of times they'll discover this looking for other things. Somebody will come in complaining of another issue and then they'll start doing a workup and finding out that there's a tumor on the kidney or maybe there's lots of blood in the urine. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we usually do routine urinalysis on individuals yearly when they have a physical exam because sometimes this can be picked up if somebody's got um, a lot of blood in the urine but they're not really symptomatic. It will then trigger um, a clinician to start looking for other, um, other, you know, a source of that, and then sometimes this will be found. It's not always found, but that's one way to find it. Um, I guess we'll go here. Um, so renal failure um, is something that can be acute. It's something that can be chronic. And then eventually, if you hit chronic renal failure, which is acronym CRF, generally the disease processes that um, lead to chronic renal failure can oftentimes lead to the next step, which is end-stage renal um, disease, which is acronym ESRD. And so most people that hit this point um, generally start um, having abnormalities in certain constituents within their urine, as well as abnormal constituents within the blood. And so chronic renal failure can take years. Um, it can take 10 to 20 years. And if you go to any dialysis unit, um, most of the people that are there are because of diabetes. Uh, but there is a small percentage of people that can actually reach chronic renal failure with hypertension. And then there's other rarer conditions like nephrotic syndrome or 
glomerular sclerosis, or even PKD, polycystic kidney disease, that can make up the other percentage of people that wind up on dialysis. But CRF is a very slow developing kidney failure that occurs over a period of years. Factors that we look at, which I'll talk about later on, are looking at some urinary constituents, um, ure urea, uric acid, and creatinine, as well as something called the glomerular filtration rate. Those are things that we can look at in the urine. And if those, um, if those features start to drop or get less, and then we do blood work that checks for those things, and we start seeing increase of urea and creatinine in the blood, there can, you can use both of those factors to actually determine someone that's in chronic renal failure. And there are percentages and criteria that are looked at that will mark the transition between someone that's in chronic renal failure where they can still manage, but there's some, there's some disease process that's affecting it and then criteria that we use to actually say, okay, this person's actually in and you know, has actually hit the stage of end-stage renal disease. And we'll talk about some of the treatments for that in just a little bit. A couple of other things to hit before we get to the treatment of end-stage renal disease. Um, there's something called vesicouretal reflux. And this is a situation where um, there's an obstruction somewhere along the ureter, whether it's in the junction between the ureter and the bladder, or somewhere along the ureter where we have backflow of urine. And so if urine um, gets into the bladder and finds its way going backwards rather than forwards, that can um, lead to problems with the kidney. It could lead to a hydronephrosis, it could lead to a pyelonephritis. And so this is generally a um, congenital disorder. And it's, it's an important one to rule out when you're dealing with pediatric patients. Um, when you have a pediatric patient that comes in um, with an, a fever of unknown source and the child hasn't been necessarily ill, there's no upper respiratory source, there's no ear source, um, kidney issues and ureteral issues are always something that has to be thought of because sometimes that fever of unknown origin can actually be an underlying pyelonephritis or a, some sort of infection in the urinary tract. And so this can be a source of that. Um, and so these people can um, oftentimes have to have a stent put in or have to have some sort of ureteral um, surgery in order to fix the patency that's occurring with this. Then we have the other tumor um, in, this, in this section called Wilms tumor. And Wilms tumor is actually a malignant tumor um, of the kidney that occurs predominantly in childhood. And so there are a number of signs and symptoms that can go along with this, um, hematuria, urine issues, but this particular um, tumor is actually most often diagnosed during a routine physical exam. And so that's, this is one of the things, there's numerous reasons why you have to take pediatric patients in so frequently to get their exams. Um, but if a routine abdominal exam, if a child is of normal weight or you know, in the normal weight range, can actually be palpated on an abdominal exam. And so any palpable mass um, in that area would be assumed to be Wilms until ruled out. And so your normal run-of-the-mill physical exams is normally what finds this particular tumor. Question. Um, in renal cell carcinoma, it is common that patients will remain asymptomatic until later stages. And we did talk about that. That is true. It is one of those cancers that oftentimes is found either incidentally um, looking for something else or possibly just doing a routine urinalysis and seeing blood. And that triggers a clinician to actually do further testing and then they discover it. Okay, so we talked a little bit about chronic renal failure. Um, here we kind of talk about the treatments when we actually reach end-stage renal disease, when we actually hit ESRD, okay? So this is what we can do. Once our kidneys no longer can support and, and filter our filter those toxins from our body, then we have to have an outer or mechanical way to do that. And there's a couple of ways that this can be done. Um, there is something called peritoneal dialysis, and this is where you actually use your own peritoneum, which is that floppy membrane within the abdominal uh, wall that kind of protects all the organs. Um, there are ways where you can actually mechanically filter through the peritoneum um, and utilize um, that peritoneal membrane is a filter and then you stick a chemical in there called a diacylate and it helps to draw all the waste products off and then you rinse the diacylate out and then you start over again. 
Okay, and so this is a way of doing it. It's a little bit um, time consuming, um, but there's a couple of different types of methods. And so there is one called the continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, um, acronym CAPD. Um, this one is a uses the peritoneum to do to with diacylate and a dwell time to actually pull all that pull all those toxins out and then you rid the diacylate out. Um, this isn't as commonly used. We'll talk about hemodialysis in a little bit, but this one does allow uh, the one thing it is is it allows for travel, and so you can actually you don't have to have a machine to do it. Um, and so you leave the diacylate solution within the abdomen for a certain period of time. It pulls out all of the toxins, and then you, re you drain it and repeat it. The problem is it is kind of process heavy. You have to do it three to five times a day. So that's, kind of, that's quite a bit of, um, of maintenance and upkeep to do it. But it does allow a person to be able to travel if necessary. So it's doable, but you can imagine if you had to do that five times a day, it might make it difficult to travel if you're in an airplane and in a hotel and what have you, but it does allow that convenience to do that. Then there's another um, type of dialysis called continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis. It's kind of similar to the CAPD, um, except that you hook up to a machine. So this is a machine that, um, that warms a solution. It cycles it sort of in the peritoneal cavity, does the same kind of process uh, where you put the fluid in there. Um, it stays in there. Um, at night, you're kind of rinsing that fluid off at night. Um, so you kind of hook yourself up every time you go to sleep. When the cycle is over, um, you leave the diacylate in there during the day for 12 to 15 hours, and then you hook yourself back up at night and then rinse that, that cycle out and repeat it. So it does give you an opportunity to be able to kind of walk around and function during the day. And then the nighttime is where all of the, the work is, is going. So that does make it nice, but it you can see how it's still kind of cumbersome. Um, there's a drainage bag and there's tubing and, and so, but it does allow you to at least not have to waste time during the day um, going through dialysis. Um, this machine probably, this, this method isn't as common. It is there, you know, it is some, some people might have a setup where they have this at home, but it is more expensive and, and logistically it isn't the most common form, but it is, it is an option. Then we have our prototypical hemodialysis, which is what we kind of see in the dialysis centers where people go and they get into a chair and they get hooked up to a machine and then they sit there for three to four hours and the machine goes through and rids all the toxins from the system. And so this is the most common, but obviously you could see if you were in a scenario where you had to do this three to four hours at a time, you know, three days a week, that's, you know, 12 to 15 hours travel time getting set up that you'd have to spend per day. And that you could see where that would get difficult, okay? And so they do have some home units, but most of them are done in a dialysis center. Um, and what happens is you, you put something in called a shunt into the non-dominant forearm, and it kind of secures the artery and vein together within the forearm and then allows an area to um, shunt out and pull out all these toxins from the system. Okay, this kind of shows the machine. You can see it's a pretty elaborate machine. Um, generally, you are gonna be awake. It looks like that guy's asleep, but you can do it when somebody's sleeping as well, but it's usually done during the day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or, um, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, depending on if the unit is open. You can see he's got a shunt hooked up to his forearm. And in order to fit your arm to the machine, you have to have something put in called an, an arteriovenous fistula. The short term for it is a shunt. And so there's an area that's created between the artery and vein in the forearm, and it allows um, access to the blood and allows access to pulling out all of those toxins, the urea and creatinine from the system. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, it's usually the non-dominant forearm. Um, you can't do blood pressures from this arm when they have a shunt in it. Um, but this is imperative in order to allow the machine access in order to um, in order to be able to do the dialysis. So you can see where this would definitely impede one's ability to live, you know, life. It, it's it's a time consuming thing, and and so people can live with dialysis. But you can see where um, it could be it's time consuming. Okay.
So if a person reaches a point where they don't want to do dialysis anymore, the, there is no cure. Once you're on dialysis, most of the time you don't come off of it. And so um, the next step, the only treatment step is to have a kidney transplant. And we have made lots of strides over the past 10, 15, 20 years in our success rates with kidney transplants. Um, we have pretty high, um, we have specific centers that do the kidney transplants. They have a pre-set up procedure schedule, they have a during, and then they have a post-care plan. And so if everybody follows these instructions, it's just very, very lengthy and it can be very difficult to deal with sometimes. But if you follow um, the procedures that they have um, been developed, that are developed and have been developed over the past um, 10, 15, 20 years, there is a much higher success rate than they used to be, okay? And so once that kidney is within the recipient and it's functioning, then that person does not have to go um, to dialysis anymore. But because we're dealing with a foreign organ within that person's system, they are going to have to take lifetime um, immunosuppressant drugs to make sure that they don't reject the kidney, okay? And so I think there's a couple pictures in here. The donor, the key, some of the keys with this is that the donor kidney um, can come from a living donor um, or even a cadaver donor. Um, you always want to try to find the very best match because that decreases the risk of rejection. Um, because we can function off of only one kidney, you only need one for transplantation. They generally do not remove the recipient's kidneys because it's very difficult to get to and it's actually more dangerous. They find a spot within the pelvic cavity and place the kidney um, and the, uh, and the adrenal glands are sitting on top of that person's um, um, old non-functioning kidneys, but generally the adrenal glands are gonna continue to work. And so we would keep those kidneys in place. I think the next picture shows there a picture. There isn't a picture. I think there's a picture in the book. Um, so prototypically when you place the donor kidney within the recipient, you're going to put it in the, the um, superior part of the iliac fossa. And I believe the book shows that on, on page 698. It kind of shows how it rests in either side of the superior iliac crest. Um, the renal artery um, or the iliac artery and iliac vein are used instead of the renal artery or they connect it into that area. Um, and then the donor ureter then gets connected into the recipient's bladder. And so that way the kidney function um, is just done a little bit farther inferior from where the other kidneys are. Um, and one of the big things when you're doing a kidney transplant is to make sure that that kidney pinks up. That's one of the first things they look for. The minute that kidney's put in and it's connected, it should start to function and work, okay? But once again, there's lots of issues for rejection and infection, and so um, that lifetime immunosuppressant drugs are going to have to happen once someone has this transplant. Okay, so one question. With some good training, this particular method can be done by patients and is convenient for traveling. So we talked about some of these things. We talked, there's three things here. We talked about hemodialysis, the continually continuous cycling, peritoneal dialysis, and then the continuous ambulatory. So in this case, traveling means ambulatory or movement. So the answer would be D, okay? Has to be done three to five times daily, but you don't need a machine. So that does make it easy to travel. True or false, when a healthy kidney is being implanted, the natural kidney or host kidney must be removed for the implantation one to work. And we just showed a picture of that. That is not true. We don't have to remove them. We keep them in place. Renal glands are still sitting in the same place and we place that newly, um, that new donor kidney into the superior part of the iliac fossa within the pelvis, the pelvic bone. Okay, so that kind of sums up some of the disease processes. So let's hit a few of the tests that are important for this particular uh, sub this particular subject. So some of these are procedures, others are talking about urine tests and blood tests. So um, one of the important blood tests that we do when we're kind of determining whether or not an individual um, is going into renal failure is called blood urea nitrogen. So the important word there is that urea nitrogen, okay? Um, nitrogenous products 
products like uh, urea and creatinine um, are toxic for the system. We must um, be able to rid those waste products um, from protein metabolism in order to maintain our normal um, internal homeostasis. Okay, so we must get rid of those. So if we have a patient that starts having um, uh, decreases in their creatinine and the urea um, clearance from the kidneys, then what generally is going to happen if, if it's not clearing in the urine, we do urine tests to check that, then this particular component will then start to rise in the blood. And it's the combination of blood and urine that lets us know what stage we're in, if we're in chronic renal failure versus whether we reach a point where we're in end-stage renal failure. So this is one of the blood tests that we use to determine whether or not a person, um, person's kidneys is actually work functioning correctly. Then we have a procedure called catheterization. And catheterization is where we actually take some um, form of a tube, whether it's rubber or whether it's a hard plastic, and we insert it into a body cavity or organ. We could be removing fluid, like urine from the bladder, or we could be instilling a substance like chemotherapy, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about catheterized urines a little bit later, but it is important to realize that this needs to be a sterile procedure. Um, all of the components that are used are sterile and you must use um, iodine swabs to cleanse the external meatus while you're doing this because if not, you can introduce um, bacteria into the bladder and cause an infection. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about the catheterized urines later. Then we have a creatinine clearance test. This is a clearance test indicates that we're looking at it as a urine test. Okay, we want to see how much creatinine we're actually clearing in the urine. And so when we start getting uh, decreases in creatinine clearance, um, that can indicate that the filtration rate is decreasing um, and that it's going to be increasing in the blood. Okay, and once again, the creatinine is a urea based or nitrogenous based. Um, byproduct toxin that we must get rid of uh, because increased levels can lead to a condition called uremia where we actually start getting, um, we're get, it can actually kill us, okay, and that's why the kidneys are so important, okay. Then we have something called, hang on, is that going to work? Nope, i got to come down. Oops. Then we have two specific tests that are um, used to actually check the bladder. The first one we have a cystoscopy. Cystoscopy is very, uh, a very highly uh, used one by urologists. And so if we break that word apart, scopy means the process of viewing. Cysto is referring to the sac or the bladder. And so this is actually a scope that we would use to look on the inside of the bladder. If someone was having chronic hematuria or there was worry that someone had um, chronic interstitial cystitis or possibly even bladder cancer, um, they could actually do a scope and take a look and see what the integrity of the inside of the bladder looks like. Then there's another test called a cystometrography, um, which is actually measuring the bladder tone or bladder pressure during filling and voiding. And so if somebody is having um, disease process of the bladder, that can be used, or if there's some sort of um, neurologic um, disruption, like in someone with... Um, multiple sclerosis. They can oftentimes use this to tell if there is um, abnormalities with either filling or voiding. Then we have another uh, um, a treatment process called extracorporeal lithotripsy. And if we break, I know there's a lot in that term. There's a lot in there, but if we break that apart, litho Lithotripsy, so tripsy means to crush or to break up. Litho means stones. Extracorporeal is referring to extra means out or outside. Corporeal is the body. And so this is a uh, process that we use for someone that has, you could do gallstones, but in this case, we're talking about kidney stones. If somebody's got some large or an a large kidney stone and is having a difficult time passing it, then you can use some uh, external shock waves um, this is a non-invasive because we don't use needles. It's non-invasive and the shock waves actually can break up the stones and make them smaller so that they can be passed. So we don't use this all the time. Some stones are very small and can become symptomatic, but they're small enough to be passed on their own. And if they are small, um, they're usually given pain medication, told to drink excessive amounts of water, 
and then they give them a strainer to go into the bathroom in so they can actually isolate those little granules. They actually sometimes just look like granules of, of sand and they can send those to the lab and kind of find out what is actually causing it. Is it calcium? Is it struvite? Is it, you know, is it what, you know, what component of is making up these, these stones? Now, calcium is the most common, about 70 to 80 percent of stones are calcium in, in origin, where that calcium precipitates. Uh, but there are a few other ions that can contribute to it, but primarily um, stones are made up of calcium. Um, then we have something called an intravenous pilogram, and this is a common test used by urologists and nephrologists um, because it's a very good radiographic study that visualizes the entire urinary tract. It gives you outlines of it gives you outlines of the ureter, the bladder, as well as the urethra. Okay, and so we do use contrast dye. It is injected intravenously as well as an oral. Um, component as well. They have to, you have to have oral and IV um, contrast media, and then you take a series of x-ray films as the medium is cleared from the blood, and so you can get a really good view of what's going on with the entire urinary tract, okay? And so this is commonly used if somebody's got a hydronephrosis, if there's some sort of disease process um, of the kidney, they can utilize this. The problem is that the IV contrast can be problematic for patients that have chronic renal failure or if there are issues with creatinine and urea clearance. So they always do um, a renal assessment. They'll do um, urine and blood work to check for kidney function before they do this because the uh, IV contrast dye can worsen chronic renal failure in some respects. So if there's a case scenario where you need to do a similar test but the person has a compromised renal um, system, they can do something called this one right here, a retrograde pilogram. Now the word retrograde indicates going backwards, okay? And so this is a scenario where instead of putting the fluid in, ay, ay, ay. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. So in the case that they can't use IV contrast, then they can actually do something called a retrograde pilogram. It's acronymed RP. And what an RP can do is introduce that, um, introduce the contrast media um, through a catheter, through the urethra into the bladder, and then it can go up through the ureter into the kidney. So you don't actually have to run the contrast through um, the nephron system. You can actually go the back way via cystoscope and via um, a catheter and actually visualize. You can put the dye in that way and take pictures and visualize it that way. So that's an alternative if you don't want, if the person's got a compromised renal, um, renal profile, you can actually use this instead of the IVP. Okay, let's go backwards a little bit. Okay, then we have um, a technique called a KUB, and that's basically, this is one of the most commonly used and old, um, kind of more of an old time test, I guess I'll say. We don't use it as much anymore because we have so many new modalities, but this is a simple x-ray of the kidneys, the ureter, and the bladder. It's just a plain x-ray film, two-dimensional um, of the lower abdominal area, but you can see some structures. You can see some size and shape of the kidneys and the ureters and then the bladder a little bit. Um, there is no contrast medium used with this x-ray so that is the nice thing um, and we used to use it all the time to detect um, kidney stones before we had some of the newer modalities. Um, so it is still used sometimes. It's much cheaper. It costs 50 $60. It doesn't cost hundreds of dollars to do a KUB and if you still if you think, you know, you can always start there, and if you see a kidney stone, you can kind of see where it's at. You can make your diagnosis, um, and once again, it is cheaper, um, and there are still some case scenarios where people will utilize it, uh, but with our new modalities, oftentimes people bypass this test and go on to other things.
Then we have something called a renal angiography, and this is kind of similar to the KUB, but they're actually utilizing um, contrast media that's injected into the blood vessels, so you can actually see the internal anatomy of the kidney. Um, and so you get an x-ray, it's an x-ray visualization, but with contrast media. And so if you need to check the integrity of the arterial system, um, this is what you need to use, um, or any kind of just the vessel system in general. Um, and it is x-ray visualization, so you do take x-rays, and then as it will illuminate the vessels that you are looking at. And this is oftentimes used instead of the KUB because you get more um, clarity, you get more visualization, but obviously contrast medium is being used, and so you have to take that into consideration. True or false, an IV pilogram is useful in identifying an obstruction in the ureter. Okay, and there's a multiple different ways to detect an obstruction in the ureter, but the IVP is one of them, and what will happen is that white dye will stop at a pinpoint area and it'll actually identify where the blockage is located. And that does help in treatment because if you're gonna do shock therapy, the lithotripsy, you know where you're dealing with. If you have to actually go in and do surgery to get rid of that, you know what you're dealing with. So there are times where that IVP um, comes in very handy. Um, then we have something called a renal scan. And a renal scan, usually if you, if you see the word scan, it usually indicates that you're using a radioactive isotope or tracer. That would be injected intravenously, and then the radioactivity over each kidney is measured as that tracer kind of passes through. And it could take a couple of hours to do this test, um, if, but if you're checking for you know, renal cancer and some other things, they might use the renal scan because it does give you um, an entire um, picture of what's going on with the kidney itself. Uh, then we have two probably more commonly used tests with the kidney. We have an ultrasound. Now we use the ultrasound for a couple of body, other body systems, and there's a couple of terms for it. You can see the word ultrasonography basically means ultrasound, but it also is the same thing as a sonogram. So you'll see all of those terms used interchangeably. And this is a procedure when sound waves are used into the body structures and it will, that sound, those sound waves will bounce off in a way that it actually gives you a picture of what's going on internally. So the nice thing about ultrasound across the board, whether we're doing an ultrasound of a fetus or the abdomen or the heart or the kidneys, is that it's not invasive. We don't have to stick needles in. We don't need sterile technique. Nobody's gonna get an infection. There's no radiation. And so the ultrasound has oftentimes gone to first for a lot of these diagnoses because there's no radiation involved. Um, it's a little more expensive than a basic x-ray, but it's less costly than some of the other things, $100, $150, $200, as opposed to a CAT scan that causes you know, $800 to $1,000, an MRI, which causes more than that. So the ultrasound is certainly has a place for detecting certain things. Stones are one of them, whether they're gallstones or kidney stones because you can oftentimes isolate where they're at. Sometimes more complicated cases won't allow you to use the ultrasound or they won't be diagnostic, but it is obviously a good starting choice because it's inexpensive, non-invasive, and can sometimes give you the information that you need. Then we go down to the basic urinalysis, and this is used, probably one of the most common tests used in primary care in gynecology as well as in urology offices. And when we do a urinalysis, we're checking multiple different aspects of the urine. We first off will do a physical inspection of what the urine looks like. We then can do a chemical analysis using um, padded uh, dipstick um, that have reagent pads that will change color according to what may or may not be within the urine. And then you can actually take a microscopic exam of the urine looking for crystals, looking for red blood cells, bacteria, epithelial cells, white blood cells, and get an idea of what those microscopic components are that are present in the urine. A urine culture is utilized if we're in a scenario where we are thinking that we actually have a UTI, urinary tract infection, also known as cystitis or if somebody has a pyelonephritis. If we're, we're thinking that it is something infection-wise, then we can actually um, take, um, a, not a sterile, but try to make sure that we have a clean catch urine so that we get rid of any possible contaminant bacteria. And then we isolate and take that urine and put it on a, um, an auger plate swab it onto um, a plate that's got a medium that will allow it to grow. We'll stick it in an incubator 
for two to three days. And then if we can isolate um, a specific organism, we can identify what it is that's causing the infection and then get a sensitivity report according to what antibiotics will actually work and be sensitive. So the urine culture definitely has its place when we are diagnosing UTIs and pyelonephritis. Then we have something called a 24-hour urine specimen. So this can be done for a couple of different reasons. Um, generally, we're going to collect all the urine in a specific 24-hour period of time. And it usually starts by emptying the bladder completely at one hour, say 7 o'clock in the morning. And then you will proceed to collect all of the urine that is voided within the next 24 hour period. And so that 24 hour period can then be used to look at volume of urine output. Um, it can be um, utilized to check certain specific components of urine, calcium output, creatinine is a big one, protein loss in a 24 hour period is another one doing a microalbuminuria. That's a common 24 hour uh, specimen. Uh, utilized with diabetics to try to assess um, lack of or, or, or renal function after having a certain specific time of uncontrolled or not well controlled diabetes. Um, and so we utilize this test for that plus a few other things. Um, you actually take this home, you urinate into a large container and then put all of that urine um, into a larger one. So you're, you're going to keep all that urine, you're going to have to refrigerate it. Um, and because you're checking for specific components, sometimes this is also called a 24-hour composite urine specimen. Um, another test that's commonly used in the urology setting is a voiding cystourethrography. It's called a VCUG. Um, and this is where we actually do an x-ray visualization of the bladder and urethra with um, basically the voiding process. And so it's sort of an active test where we inject contrast material and then watch how the bladder watch the process of the avoiding um, with that contrast material in there this is probably one of the more commonly used tests and if people have issues with um, urethral strictures or if they've got some nervous intervention or some muscular issue this can give a lot of information as to what's going on in the bladder and the urethra another question which of the following would be done if a bladder infection was suspected. So in this case, we have basically four choices, three really. So if we thought there was an infection done, we talk about a couple of things that we need to do. We need to do a urinalysis first because we need to check. Um, we need to look at the microscopic view. We need to use the reagent dip pads and see whether or not there's blood or pus or urine, or I'm um, sorry, blood pus or white blood cells. Um, and then at that point, if it does look like there's an infection, then we, it's really advisable to send for a urine culture. We want to find out what the um, pathogenic bacteria is causing the infection, and we want to get a sensitivity report so that we know um, what antibiotics will work. Okay, so in this case, um, A and B are correct, so the answer would be D. When we have a routine, um, if we have a routine um, infection, there really isn't any reason to do an ultrasound, okay? All right, so then we have, we talked earlier about what catheterization is. There are times where you might have to get a catheterized urine specimen. Um, this is also known as a sterile specimen because you're inserting a sterile um, object into the, your, into the bladder via the urethra so that we can actually get a sterile um, specimen of urine. And so remember, we don't, normally the urine does not have bacteria in it unless there's an infection with a known pathogen or some pathogen, or you can also get um, contamination from external skin. Because remember, we have flora, normal bacterial flora on our skin. And so if the urine touches that on the way out, then that can cause a bacterial contaminant. So we always want to know what the offending organism is or the pathogenic organism. So there are some cases where maybe a person can't urinate and do a clean catch urine, which we'll talk about in a minute on their own. So if we have a pediatric patient that we are wondering whether or not that patient has a bladder infection or a kidney infection, we might have to catheterize them. If we have a case scenario where a patient can't urinate, they have some sort of neurogenic issue. Um, if, they're, if, they're, um, if they're paralyzed and they can't control their urine. So there's case scenarios where you need that sterile specimen. 
And so that's where you would do a sterile technique um, or aseptic technique where you use iodine on the external meatus of the urethra, clean it off and make sure you have a sterile pack and um, insert a specific kind of catheter so that you can actually get the urine flow through the catheter and, contain, and, and obtain that sterile specimen. There are catheters that are straight and plastic if you need to do a quick, um, if you need to do just a quick withdrawal of urine. Um, if you're gonna leave it in for a while, like for surgery, then they'll usually use something called a Foley catheter, which is a rubber, kind of a rubbery um, consistency where there's a balloon on the inside and it actually allows that the uh, Foley to stay placed so that you can actually obtain urine for a prolonged period of time if necessary. Then we have a clean catch midstream urine specimen. This is commonly used, once again, if we are suspecting a bladder infection. Uh, the collection method is designed to clean off the external genitalia so we don't get um, microorganisms from the external genitalia skin to contaminate. So you have to use the small wipies. Um, men and women can do this. Um, you normally will urinate a little bit into the toilet, then you will clean yourself with the, with the pads and then you'll put the rest of the specimen into the sterile urine container. And then from that point, um, they can do the analysis. They would have to do a catheterized specimen if you have a patient that is unable to perform this particular type of specimen on their own. Then we have something called a first voided specimen. This is generally um, done early in the morning. So first void just means the first time you urinate. Um, there, most of the time when people sleep for six to eight hours and if they don't get up in the middle of the night, um, that first urine's got more solutes or more um, crystallites in it. So if you're specifically looking for something um, in particular, sometimes getting a first voided specimen will have increased number of whatever solute you're looking for. And so that specimen can be um, placed in the refrigerator. If you get up at six o'clock in the morning and urinate, and you're not going to the clinic until 10, um, they can put it in the refrigerator labeled, um, put in a, in a, you know, some sort of Ziploc bag and then take into the office. It is better to keep it refrigerated um, because if you can't do an analysis on the urine within the first hour, it needs to be put in the refrigerator. Otherwise it can start to precipitate and, uh, and precipitate and have um, some abnormal cloudiness that normally isn't there. Then we have a random urine specimen. Um, this is basically just urine done at any given time. You don't have to do a clean catch. Sometimes they call this a dirty specimen because you're not cleaning yourself. Um, pregnancy tests can be done in a random specimen um, formation as can um, sexually transmitted infection checks for gonorrhea and chlamydia. You wouldn't want to clean yourself for those because sometimes that would affect the outcome um, of obtaining that particular sexually transmitted infection. So random urines or dirty urines can be used for pregnancy testing um, as well as doing um, urine checks for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Okay. Then we have something called a residual urine specimen. This is usually an amount of urine that's left over in the bladder after a particular, um, after a person has attempted to void on their own. And so if they're suspecting that there's a, maybe some bladder pathology, um, this does tend to be more common in multiple sclerosis patients, or like I said, somebody that has nervous um, intervention problems with the bladder, where they'll think they're completely emptying their bladder, but then when they go in there, there's still a large residual volume. And so this is just a volume of urine that's left over after a person has attempted to completely void. And so generally levels above 25 to 50 mils, I think anything above that would be considered a high residual volume and might indicate that there is something um, pathologically going on with the kidney or with the bladder. And a question, the term used for urine left over after voiding is called, we just talked about it, that is called the residual volume. So that is A. Okay, so that kind of takes us through um, the diagnostic procedures and through the disease processes. So I will go ahead and check out now and I will um, see you in the next video.